Hello, my name is Jason Davis, and today I'll be a tour guide to the most infinite characters of America, Al Capone, the real gangster. This documentary will go through his early life in Brooklyn, to his ascension to the Chicago outfit, and how he made his millions and millions from prohibition. Come and join me and learn about the story of this infamous character, Al Capone. The story of Al Capone started in 1899, where he was born to Italian immigrants, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Capone. They moved in 1893 to Brooklyn, New York. During his youth, Al Capone was a semi-pro baseball player, and he was inspired by many different gangsters, such as Torrio. And he had a very, very strict Catholic school upbringing. He, he had to do some little jobs to get around in Brooklyn because it was a very tough environment for him when he was younger and that's when this established his criminal ideology. When Prohibition was enforced in 1920s with the 18th Amendment change, Al Capone took it upon himself and decided to seize the opportunity to open up bootlegging rings and even speakeasies. As you see, I a local speakeasy in Blackwood called Witherspoons. God knows what happens there. To be honest, I wouldn't want to be in there. So, due to all this bootlegging, whiskey was never running dry in America, and especially in Chicago, alcohol was everywhere. Due to all this, the Ford Motor Company decided to take it upon themselves to ban anyone to drink alcohol, and they blamed it on a diminishing production efficiency. New, the New York police really struggled to enforce a ban and was often bribed and the anti saloon league always campaigned to keep America dry but any of because of this Al Capone pushed through and with all this sort of his popularity and fame in Chicago he it just sparked violence in Chicago and this led to many crimes and the most famous of which being the St Valentine's massacre in 1923, Al Capone purchased a modest resident in Park Manor, the south side of Chicago. At this time, suspicions arose that he, he, he had some involvement in the murder of Johnny Torrio's predecessor, Big Jim. Chicago was a powder keg of rivalries, with the, with the Italian organised crime syndicate led by Torrio versing between other syndicates. Um, uh, the North Side Gang, um, run by Obanian was one of the main people that they opposed. But they were all, and it was a constant target due to the fact they opposed due to the other crime syndicate known as the Jenner Brothers. To maintain control and broker deals, Trio orchestrated a very, very, very sinister assassination attempt on Obanian. And this, therefore, would change the leadership of the faction forever. Amidst all this chaos of prohibition, Capone found a niche. He worked closely with Canadian bootleggers to be able to get alcohol into America due to the fact that America's neighbours weren't... America's neighbours, Mexico, Canada, the Caribbean and even Europe, did not have such prohibition. So this would lead people called rum runners to run across the border. So. They, they would um, transport spirits over the border of Canada and obviously into Chicago and therefore this would, this would keep the whiskey not running dry in the speakeasies. So, well, all the, um, so obviously this caused a lot of chaos in the um, Chicago outfit as we have multiple people rising to power and this led to a power struggle in Chicago. So we'll learn more about the crimes, such as the St. Valentine's Day massacre and so many other crimes. This like powder keg led to explode and we'd see these absolute terrible crimes and murder happen in the streets of Chicago. A crucial turning point in uh, Al Capone's criminal career happened in 1925. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do apologise, we're in a bus. After being gravely injured by an assassination attempt, Torrio handed over leadership to Al Capone and he retreated to Brooklyn as obviously he was, he was on the brink of dying. So Capone's rise to power was distinguished as like really, really, really violent and gang battles just ran rampant everywhere. And he worked really hard to keep racketeering rights in several parts of Chicago and th this was strengthened in his renown. As other gangs would, uh, if other gangs was ruthlessly destroyed, 
So Rio became a five dun ruled by the Capone Mafia. So that basically means that Capone's dominance was undeniable. Everyone knew that he was going to be the leader of Chicago and, he, and his strength was just growing day after day with the amount of power he had and the amount of speakeasies and bootlegging operations he ran in Chicago. This would eventually mean that he'd be taken over. So his network of contacts reached the highest level of society, cemented his position in the most powerful person of Chicago, and he was he was the most feared figure in American crime syndicates. As Capone grew more and more popular, his crimes just got worse and worse. The most atrocious being the St. Valentine's Day Massacre on February the 14th. 1929. The Al Capone's gang members of the Chicago outfit did the most atrocious thing you could ever do and play dirty as you could say. They lured people, they lured not they lured specific rival gang members to a street on North Clark Street and his gang members of Al Capone were dressed up as police officers. And the worst part about it is, they forced those rival gang, uh, gang members to go against the wall of a garage on that street and they shot them down. They obliterated them and unspeakable actions were taken towards them, shot them to death. And this shook Chicago as a whole and this marked Chicago as an unlawful battleground for these for these criminals I guess and with all this happening it's just made everyone in America wonder has prohibition gone too far and this really established Al Capone's horrible reign all just to make sure that he could maintain racketeering rights in Chicago and ensure that his rival gangs know who's top dog, Al Capone is. And this was all for to make sure that he was the main alcohol producer and seller, and he was the number one speakeasy's owner. But does that mean it costed rival gangs life? No, it does not. He took it too far this time. It shook the city, and this will always be remembered as probably the, the worst actions Al Capone has ever, ever done during his life. So now Al Capone's reign has now ended, well, sort of. In 1931, he was arrested and put in prison for 11 years. But oddly enough, it wasn't due to his uh, violent crimes. It was due to federal tax evasion. The IRS found out about him opening up illegal speakeasies. And obviously, he wasn't paying tax. It was illegal to start with. So he was 11 years behind bars. So. But this doesn't mean he lost touch of his criminal empire. He still kept it going, even in Alcatraz prison. And we still don't really know how. Um, there are a few speculations. But, and it just is not quite fair for those seven to eight lives he took during the St. Uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre and him to just only be arrested for 11 years, put in Alcatraz prison, just for tax evasion. It just proves 
how invalid the American justice system was at the time. And we could only speculate, were the judges possibly bribed? Were, were they um, just like kind of sweeping it under the rug about his crimes being a, a, a prohibition alcohol dealer and a rum runner and a bootlegger and opening up speake speakeasies? Well, only time will tell. But it just seems... It just really proves how America as a whole hasn't really changed. It's always been a little bit of a conservative and not very, not very liberal country. And they, they say that they're a land of the free, but they can't charge someone with murder of seven to eight people due to the St. Valentine's Day massacre. That is not what America stands for. And I don't think it ever will be. It just proves how much prohibition failed in America. And Al Capone did eventually die. Yeah, um, he died in his uh, his Florida mansion. He even kept all his money from his speakeasy running, right? So uh, yeah, he had met many strokes. He had a brain condition, and that eventually did bring him down. And he didn't have his empire anymore. And even a psychiatrist said that he had the brain power of a twelve-year-old. And then that's why he was left to rest and live his days, last few days, in his Florida home in, in Long Beach. So, I'll now bring you to the conclusion. So, on to the next part. As we wrap up this story about Al Capone, we could only think, how much of a mark has he left on American society and society as a whole? He's such a complex character in this world and he will be remembered for generations of just of how complex the American criminal world is to even to this day. Drug violence is still around to this day and even alcohol abuse is still runs rampant. And we could only ask ourselves this how is Al Capone very similar to modern day crimes? But I'm gonna be I'll leave that question for you to decide. How has Al Capone affected life? Not only to today in the criminal world, but in the past for doing prohibition. Thank you for watching. Let's roll on to the credits.